I think we're talking about two things, but they have to be together. When uh, we talk about employee empowerment, uh, this is not, if you like, to create anarchy. In employee empowerment has a purpose. It's to give people power, basically to manage their work environment, to be in charge of it, but more importantly is to deliver what they're good at. People are good at creativity and innovation. That is the human potential. That is really what intellectual capital is about. So power to the people is for creativity and innovation. And perhaps to kick off just a few um, quotes here and there, um, I think why do we need empowerment in any organization is because uh, we cannot manage organizations through one individual or through a small number of people. So that power has got to be distributed in order for organizations to build the synergy levels and to create the optimum impact. Uh, it's delegation in a sense. Uh, that's one way of describing it. A few quotes from Henry Ford. And he talks about the consequences of empowerment. Failure is the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. We will see a little bit more later on one organization in particular that admits that failure is part of learning and uh, it's 3M. So failure is not failure unless we don't inject the learning that comes out of it. I often quote the example of the uh, originator of um, uh, Nissan in Japan after the Second World War, when he built the first major plant, um, um, a journalist asked him, and he said, aren't you afraid of uh, failing, you know, by spending so much money on a, a, a major plant? Uh, and the, uh, the founder of Nissan smiled and said, my failure will be Japan's success. In other words, others will learn not to make the same mistake as myself. Again, in the context of empowerment, the only security that we have is the reserve of knowledge, experience, and ability. If we don't allow people to experiment, how can we, uh, if you like, fill the cycle of uh, learning, experimentation, and uh, capturing uh, best practices? Experimentation does not deliver um, uh, sure and uh, guaranteed results. Uh, and that cycle of uh, enhancing human potential has to be there. Uh, and empowerment is really getting people to do what is right, you know, as far as their judgment is concerned, um, use the, their instincts, uh, use their experience, uh, use their passion, use their imagination and everything else. Those subtle, soft human skills and competencies are not very often recognized in many organizations. Thinking is the hardest work there is, which is the probable reason why so few engage in it. It is true for mechanistic organizations, isn't it? Those organizations that don't have empowerment, you can actually do research and find that uh, they are uh, stifling the energies of people, uh, they are highly bureaucratic, they are centralized, they drive by fear, and therefore they kill the instinct, the human instinct to create, and people become like robots, they are mechanized. And I think that this is the worst thing that any organization can do. Again, just a few quotes. If you want to succeed, you should strike out on new paths rather than travel the worn path of accepted success. You know, success is finite. Success is relative and uh, can only be celebrated at a particular point in time. Uh, you can't carry it forward. Uh, you must build on it. And therefore, innovation and creativity is about this continuous cycle of empowering and uh, re-empowering and so on and so forth. Uh, empowerment is also about enthusiasm. It's the mother of effort, and without it, nothing great was ever achieved. You know, people, when empowered, give the extra mile. You know, they, they give with passion, they give with dedication, they give with commitment. So just to sum up this brief introduction, I think the word empowerment is really about uh, giving authority. It's about enabling people with the way we describe their jobs uh, and specify their roles and responsibilities but also it's about uh, permitting them to commit mistakes and learn and uh, basically, um, uh, you know, move forward. Um, it is a top-down responsibility. Empowerment cannot be just handed over to people because we like them or uh, because we are biased with our views. It is a responsibility. I remember a few years ago I interviewed the chairman of Xerox UK and he said to me that within Xerox, we use empowerment as a way of controlling people. If you like, the top-down empowerment uh, um, creates the bottom-up accountability. 
So you can have transparent accountability because you have injected trust. You have conveyed a sense of responsibility. And if you enable the person, basically, by allowing them to uh, get on with the job uh, as process owner, as uh, the people who have got the expertise and the experience and the knowledge for making things happen, then they, there is no fear in them if you're reporting bottom-up, transparently um, and um, honestly. The route to uh, empowerment is not a straightforward one. If you look at um, uh, the benefits, first of all, um, I think they are there uh, to be quantified. First of all, it gives an organization to um, sense and feel the customer because people are working for doing, the, the, if you like, the right jobs rather than doing the job right. Because the, doing the job right is about efficiency, isn't it? It's don't rock the boat, do as you're told, and, uh, you know, and you, during your appraisal you get the, you know, the pat on the shoulder and you get your salary scale uh, revised. But doing the right job is really the employee asking the fundamental questions about the value added, about the orientation, about what the customer needs and about injecting that creativity and that passion that we talked about earlier on to deliver extraordinary value. And because there is that passion which carries people forward, there is a challenge there that needs to be uh, dealt with all the time. So the improvements in service delivery, the improvements through problem solving and increasing productivity are there because people want to prove that they are good at what they do. There is a sense of pride, if you like. So we can say that empowerment injects uh, pride and dignity. So in order to create a climate of empowerment, first of all, we have to encourage people. Uh, you cannot just force people and say, I'm empowering to do this, go and do it. It will not happen. We need to present them to the work environment. We need to make them stakeholders in the work environment. And we need to give them that sense of ownership and responsibility. And at the highest level, basically, we need to talk about people who can take decisions, make decisions, and take risks and accept the responsibilities to do with that. So perhaps it's a culture transformation that needs to happen uh, for uh, any organization to benefit from empowerment. Very quickly, uh, talk about um, 3M. Uh, it's an organization that is known worldwide for its uh, innovative ability. Uh, recently, they've celebrated one century of innovation. And they said, well, for us, innovation occurs because uh, we expect it to happen. You know, this is the way we do things around here. But they manage it, they nurture it, and they audit it, and they make sure it happens effectively. So innovation is a managed process as far as uh, 3M is concerned. What drives innovation? Uh, within uh, 3M are uh, the, the following key elements. Having a vision for innovation, putting stretch goals in innovation, uh, a constant customer focus. But look at that, one word, empowerment. And I will say a little bit more about this. Communication, transparency, uh, networking and creating an organization that is learning and that perpetuates itself, and recognition, recognizing innovative contributions and empowerment. But let's look at empowerment on its own. What does that mean? One of the founders of 3M, uh, William McKnight, uh, said you know, that one of the values of 3M is to give people freedom to do their jobs. Because we employ people not because they are robots. We employ them because they have a brain. And uh, it's the uh, intellectual uh, uh, capital that we want to capitalize on. We need to accept that risk-taking is part of doing the job. Thirdly, people can make mistakes, because that's how you learn. If you don't make mistakes, how do you know? And the fourth thing is, we need to really grow the asset. We need to encourage learning and growth in intellectual capital. These things, by the way, have been said and mentioned uh, over 100 years ago. They're not new. Here we are now, 21st century, we talk about the learning organization, the knowledge management, the intellectual capital. And we are using new jargon and new words. But over 100 years ago, a visionary organization has recognized that empowerment is essential for success. What I want to do now is give you a best practice perspective on the context of empowerment. It's really getting the 1 plus 1 plus 1 equal 10. It's building highly empowered teams and high synergy. First of all, as I said, it is about doing the right job. It's not about being mechanized and being efficient. 
in order for us to do this is not to stifle uh, the culture for empowerment by not focusing on cost control but cause, focusing on value added. If you focus on value added, implicitly you are managing with cost sensitivities. But if you start to put in positions through cost control, what do you expect? People will do uh, the job uh, right first time. Right first time means the way you prescribed it. So if it is garbage in, garbage out, I am not going to deviate from what you set out for me. I will do exactly what you asked me to do without, uh, if you like, rocking the boat. But that is not what we want because that really stifles empowerment. So that's the uh, rule number one. And again, empowerment is trust, isn't it? So we must look at people as the key asset. They drive the improvement. They deliver value to the customer. They are the ones, the custodians, basically, of the value chain. And uh, if, we, if we give them room to maneuver and we grow them, we grow quality. If we stifle them, we stifle quality. The consequences is that the loser at the end of the day, first of all, is going to be to the customer and secondly, it's going to be the organization. Employee attitudes are byproducts of leadership style, you know? It's like uh, motherhood and, um, you know, and basically the offspring here. That's the direct relationship. And again, research indicates this time and time again. When you work in a culture where the empowerment is really there, you can directly say leadership at the top must be promoting it. They must really create that climate of ease, of comfort, where people uh, you know, can speak freely. They can take actions. They can make decisions. And if you have leadership that are stifles at the top, nothing will happen within the organization. With all the goodwill in the world, that will never happen. Sharing knowledge inspires motivation because, the, if you like, knowledge becomes powerful. Knowledge is not power. You're not creating, if you like, a, a, a suboptimized organization. Empowerment means it travels throughout the value chain. The links are there and people recognize that Passing on knowledge, passing on expertise, supporting the other team members can only be good for them and can only be good for the organization. The focus is the same. Number five, coaching and not controlling. Because we're growing people and then consequently by growing people and inspiring them, they will find the solutions to the problems. They are the ones who find the breakthrough thinking and they are the ones who will deliver extraordinary innovations for the future. If we control people, we kill innovation, and therefore we create mistrust and suspicion and so on and so forth. Uh, giving team the responsibility is like giving, first of all, the individual responsibility. The teams are focused on one goal. They want to deliver extraordinary value. They are aware of the problems. They manage the processes. And if they have the authority to manage and control the processes, then they will deliver the objectives. Of course, support has got to be the, uh, the end of it. I mean, empowerment does not happen on its own. It has to be fueled. And we have to give people the tools. Uh, we have to give them the right infrastructure and the work environment so that they can complete their tasks. Without that, obviously, um, uh, you know, they will hit roadblocks. Uh, you create frustration. And you start to go back to the negative cycle again of mistrust, of suspicion, uh, of disappointment and so on and so forth. And the opportunity to learn is plan, do, check, act. Basically it's the problem, the experimentation, the learning that comes out of it and the knowledge that gets embedded in the organization. And the more you do this, the more learning you become and the more confident the organization becomes and the bigger is the intellectual asset and uh, the higher is the capability to compete externally. Of course, the Maslow theory of needs is, a, is a fundamentally important, you know. People work for this team, they work for their own self-actualization, but at the end of the day, a human nature being as it is, we like, uh, if you like, the recognition. We like to be tickled and we like the thank yous and we like to be looked after, or our basic needs to be looked after. And I think you will find again that the likes of 3M and other organizations look after our, their empowered teams properly, and they all pay well above uh, average. You, know? you lose uh, a, a confident person, 
somebody who is passionate, somebody who understands the meaning of empowerment, you're losing some of your intellectual assets. Nowadays, this is how you measure the loss. It's not just numbers leaving out, bring in the same numbers in. It's not like that at all. It's much more fundamentally important. So, just to finish the talk, uh, again, you have uh, these critical factors. Now, I move away from the individual, the meaning of empowerment vis-a-vis -vis the average employee. And now I'm going to put, um, uh, if you like, a list of conditions of success for becoming a learning organization. Having a talented workforce is, uh, is, 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 a, is a number one criteria for becoming a learning organization. Learning organizations are those that are capable to attract, but also to retain, recruit and retain highly talented people. And if retention really is a consequence of empowerment, is a consequence of motivation and satisfaction, is a consequence of looking after the Maslow theory uh, of hierarchy of needs. You know, people who are empowered, they're pride, they're well paid, they have the freedom to innovate and create, they can make mistakes and there is no fear and consequences to pay. Why would they decide to go somewhere else? It doesn't make sense, does it? Having distributed and democratic uh, uh, leadership, I mean, this is quite interesting actually. It means that structure becomes uh, just uh, uh, as a means to an end. Structure is not the end. And I think those of you who do strategic management, you would have been told this. So structure can be broken down, can be re-engineered. At, at the end of the day, we want to create two types of leadership. Democratic leadership is really about leaders who herd the sheep in the same direction. I'm sorry to describe people in that, uh, in that way, but uh, metaphorically speaking, we want to create goal alignment. You want to create uh, congruence and one vision and everybody else driving behind that vision. But distributed leadership is the cascade of corporate leadership. It's really creating uh, communities of learning, if you like, and the creating the synergy levels within the organizations via the specialist competencies, via the experience and the expertise that exists, so that the organization is enabled and not disabled. And those are two major tasks of leadership in the 21st century. Working externally and internally through partnerships and alliances. You know, leveraging is a big word nowadays. And that is having that fabric, that network of contacts with universities, with suppliers, with a wider community. Because you must leverage to grow. You cannot just rely on your own individual capabilities. Having meaningful relationships marked by care and trust. In other words, you know, uh, being confident and being transparent about sharing knowledge, um, uh, an organization caring for its employees, trusting basically the judgment of other people, and uh, creating harmony, perhaps by going back to the basics and the fundamentals that we alluded to a couple of weeks ago on values and their inculcation, walking the talk. You know, this is the way we do things around here. You know, being happy, part of a happy family uh, and those kind of things. Having a collective sense of responsibility and taking ownership for organizational success. In other words, you know, process ownership is uh, also the RROs, the roles, responsibilities and objectives. You know, that's what it means. Accountability, transparency, governance, performance reporting, performance review. And also buying in the vision by saying that it doesn't matter where you are, if you like, in the hierarchy of the organization. Everybody adds value, everybody lends support, and we are all contributing to the success of the organization. And of course, empowerment and giving the autonomy to the workforce. Autonomy does not mean um, anarchy. It means, as we said earlier on, uh, being able to take the action, being able to use, uh, if you like, the subtle aspects of um, uh, uh, you know, inner creativity, but also the experience and the confidence that exists there. It's having that courage, basically, and the beliefs and the passion to serve the customer in the right way without thinking about uh, repercussions and uh, consequences for doing that. 
and having a, a reasonable base for sh shared goals, values, and practices among system members. You know, you can criticize constructively without uh, any fear. Um, you create consensus by having open dialogue and debate. Uh, and you can create agreement because the vision and the mission and the cri critical objectives are the same. And, you know, having diversity in terms of thinking, you know, managing conflict. People are not the same. And it's good that we're not the same because we fulfill different roles. We have different intuition uh, levels and we have different competencies. We bring to the table different uh, things. So the differences within us is a wealth for the organization. But what br brings us together is the same passion, the same spirit of continuous improvement, and the same values that we would like to see inculcated in our organization. So I think, uh, if you like, if you wanted to take something away with you today, to say, well, what is it that we have to do to create empowerment in our organization, but also to, for us as an organization to grow and prosper and become uh, a learning organization and highly innovative, these bullets that I'll go through very quickly will be useful. First of all, unleash the potential of people. Create a, a confident culture of experimentation, of reflection, of learning, and of embedding best practices and knowledge. And create the infrastructure for, uh, a, as a repository for that knowledge. So it accumulates and is not going to dissipate and be lost uh, somewhere else have the drivers of that learning so it is continuous. Measure it, grow it, guide it, uh, prompt it, uh, facilitate it, whatever it takes. Create interdependency, don't create silos because silos kill and stifle. You know, interdependency means one plus one plus one equals ten. It's the synergy levels that we talked about. And create transparency and openness in terms of the flow of information, the sharing and the transfer of best practices. Use information really as the ecosystem, breathing information, speaking information, um, you know, making decisions on information and so on. And be results oriented. Accountability, as I said, is really two way, synchronizing via goals cascading down, performance reviews and reporting bottom up, and then you have the duality that you need for becoming a learning organization. Have these boundaries that can be broken. Remember what I said, structure often kills if it is the wrong structure. You need to really uh, make it malleable, you know, so it serves the purpose of guiding and not hindering. And get down uh, to speed, um, uh, if you like, by shrinking the accountability uh, root and by uh, making empowerment happen. Empowerment will not be found in an organization that has six or seven layers. You know, you will not find it anywhere in the world. Flat organizations are equivalent with highly empowering organizations. And make it, if you like, inclusive rather than exclusive because in the 21st century, it's quite normal for organizations, despite all the goodwill in the world about retention and everything else, it's quite normal for organizations to lose with regret, but to replenish and bring in new skills and competencies. So you must think about creating a climate which accommodates new people and brings in uh, their experiences and their expertises. And always find a way of reassuring people about the intentions of the organization towards uh, the, the inculcations of the values, preserving the culture, and so on and so forth. You know, if people go and work for 3M, they've got something in mind. I know at 3M I'm going to be happy because I know they encourage uh, experimentation and they have uh, emphasis on empowerment. And I know they recognize individuals' contribution. And I would like to shine one day. That's what drives people. Maybe the pay is there somewhere. But believe me, it will not be right at the top. So I think this is just a summary, and again, I go back with a couple of quotes. First of all, you know, if we empower people, we have really made them obliging, you know, because as this quote says, it's rare to find a person who does not respond positively to a polite word or kind gesture, you know, rather than giving them an order and uh, creating that mistrust. So empowerment creates motivation, real motivation. 
and it gives the organization the extra miles free of charge. And as Henry Ford says, I could use a hundred people who don't know that there is such a word as impossible. In other words, people will do their level best and they will not be hindered because the fear factor has been completely removed from them and you have created sustainable um, uh, empowerment.